we're not moving fast enough because I truly think that companies are still not buying 100% into this. Legislation has to play a huge role, but I also think there needs to be more players in the post-consumer supply chain. And also, I think we need to be very honest again that not every brand has to follow the same guidelines. Fast fashion companies have the money to really make a huge change in this industry, but implementing in the supply chain, you know, fair wages, chemistry safety, you name it, all of that, rather than really spending money and mending or repairing their collections. In today's episode, I'm super happy to welcome Carmen Gama, the Director of Circular Design at Eileen Fisher and a trailblazer in fashion remanufacturing. With over eight years at Eileen Fisher, Carmen has been instrumental in developing innovative circular systems for textile waste, establishing the company as a front runner in the circular economy. In addition to her pivotal role at Eileen Fisher, Carmen co-founded Make Anew, a B2B circular design recycling center underscoring her deep commitment to sustainable fashion. Renowned for blending creative designs with sustainable business strategies, Carmen's influence reaches well beyond her professional roles. Having been featured in leading publications like Women's Wear Daily and the Wall Street Journal, she brings a wealth of expertise to our conversation on the evolution of fashion recycling and upcycling. Join us for an enlightening journey as we go beyond sustainability and circular design with Carmen Gama. Carmen, it is a pleasure to have you with us today. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much, Jaime, for having me. I'm very excited to be having this conversation with you. Me too. I mean, this is a topic that is not only dear to my heart, but also so um, so top of mind today for so many people. And you're definitely an expert um, to give even more context. We met uh, when we uh, I visited um, the Eileen Fisher Recycling Center um, in New York, not long ago, end of last year, and I was just impressed. And and the funny thing is that when we would say that we're going there at the end of the week, um, we're going to Ellen Fisher's recycling center. Everyone was so excited because they <laughs> knew about it. Um, and and I think it it is quite popular these days. Um, but before we go into the topic of Eileen Fisher and 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 everything uh, that you're doing there. Um, I want to ask you, um, where does this passion for fashion and sustainability um, come from? Yes, of course. Oh, well, first of all, it was my pleasure to actually meet you in person at the facility. It was really nice to have you, all of them, and give you the tour. You know, it is very popular. People love our tours. And yeah. sometimes we like, have to put like stops because there's so many people <laughs> wanting to tour. But like, we were so excited to have you. Anyway, you. so going to my background, I. You know, I'm from Mexico. I was born and raised Mexican. Um, I always knew that I wanted to be a fashion designer since I was a little girl, right? Um, there's no nothing exciting about this story. I guess all of the designers have the same story. But I think what's fascinating or special in my case is that I come from a family in Mexico where my father, he's a shoe designer. He had a shoe factory. So I kind of mm. like grew up in that area. My mom was a seamstress and she will make our own clothes and her clothes. So I kind of like grew up in that artistic environment. But at the same time, I grew up in a family where I was very conscious about waste, especially mm -hmm. both like monetary waste and resources waste. Mm -hmm. One is because we didn't have a lot of money to, you know, waste or like buy new clothing or buy, you know, resources to make patterns and stuff like that. So my mom, for example, she will be like, teaching me how to make my own patterns with newspapers mm. because she will be like, well, I don't want to waste money buying yes. new paper. And I also <laughs> don't want to help contribute to cut more trees because of this paper. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in that, but like you really never click fashion with that. You mm -hmm. know, it was just how I was brought up, very conscious yeah. about it. And yeah, I mean, I guess years later in Parsons, when I was doing my BFA in fashion there, I was very lucky to be surrounded by people who helped me open my eyes to the huge amount of waste this industry brings. Mm -hmm. So I think that's when everything clicked for me. I was like, oh, wait, I love fashion, but mm -hmm. I don't like waste. <laughs> I don't want to be part of the problem. So I think that's kind of where I come from. 
that's yeah I, I i we briefly talked about this when we met or or later i don't remember mm-hmm. but i have a very similar story you know I'm in my family um so we come from an from an island in venezuela my family was mm-hmm. you know everyone is from that island and my grandma had a textile um store and mm-hmm. all my mom my aunts they they grew up making their own clothes um and the same culture of waste was embedded and it was it's weird because it was never um something like you said in the same way you say it was not something so evident it was kind of like just the way things were um mm-hmm. and in our case it was a very small town i don't know if how how large the city uh, where you were born was but do you think it's kind of like a a, a culture of that you know upbringing of a kind of like smaller towns that people just go on with their lives in that way being very mindful or was there something particular from your family and their the, the attitude that they had towards it well i come from a, like a 2.5 million right. uh, city so not it's a town. A hu- no it's not a town <laughs> i call it a town because once you are in your circle you know everybody and that's it right yeah, <laughs> it yeah, feels like yeah, a town <laughs> yeah but no it's a huge industrial city you know like huge canneries like well renowned internationally like it's the shoe business you know shoe manufacturing so you know the timberlands you know like there's a lot of that business in where i grew up and where i'm from um I don't I don't know if all of the families are like that. I guess it was just more like my mom does come from a small town in Jalisco, mm-hmm. in Guadalajara. Mm-hmm. So I guess she also didn't grow up with a lot. So mm-hmm. she was always very resourceful with what she had. Also because she wanted to put all of the resources towards our education. Because yeah. she knew that that was the best thing that she can give us. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the rest, she had to be very resourceful. And also she was very conscious about the environment because she grew up like in a farm, you know, mm-hmm. with pigs and horses and everything. So I guess she comes from that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would not know about the rest. Like in general, a country in Mexico, you know, we're very resourceful. You know, it's mm-hmm. like countries that don't come from a lot of money. You know, mm-hmm. people mm-hmm. make people just very smart and they're mm-hmm. very, you know, entrepreneurial in like trying to figure out how to go day by day with what they have. You yeah. know, so, you know, now we we are here in these like first first world country, you know, like <laughs> trying to be sustainable. And it's only for the like, you know, the privileged people. But like, you know, when you go through a third world country, like that's what we do on a daily basis, yeah. you know. So yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, it is funny. Because, you know, when I'm here on a day today, my parents are visiting now. They have been here for a few months. And it gets, sometimes it gets annoying to a point that, you know, we want to sometimes reuse too much. And, 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 and I find myself like sometimes like, you know, let's, you know, let's stop bringing stuff from the streets into our home and, and, and trying to yeah. find or repurpose stuff. Uh, yeah. But it's like you said, you know, we, it, it is kind of like embedded in, in, in some of us at least. Um, yeah. So it's, yeah, I think it's, it's sometimes we take that for granted. Um, so how does that, uh, where is the jump from? I want to be a fashion designer to let's now work for a corporation and, in in the sustainability basically side of it is there Mm -hmm. a transition or are you working as a fashion designer from the very first moment uh, from a sustainability angle well well again when i switched in parsons my mentality again i always i wanted to work for christian dior that's the one that i wanted to work (laughs) for that was my shoot to the moon goal and i want to even be better than him i want to be the best designer in the world (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> love the goals now i'm like no i don't want to work for them um but <laughs> unless if i'm like handling their circularity but right. anyway <laughs> all um what i'm saying is that um at parsons then my last year i was kind of like in conflict i was like oh man i don't want to work for any company now you know i don't mm-hmm. i want to just be help create ish, uh solutions for textile waste and I, I didn't know about Eileen Fisher. I had no idea who there was because, again, mm-hmm. I come from Mexico. My grandma does not buy Eileen Fisher, right? Mm-hmm. There's no Eileen <laughs> Fisher in Mexico. And if there was, there was no money to buy Eileen Fisher. <laughs> yeah. So Patagonia was the one that I wanted to work for. 
because okay. I'm an outerwear designer at heart. Like I love outerwear. I'm like all about functionality and like, you know, so I, I wanted to, but I, I didn't want to move to California. I'm like, no, mm. <laughs> it's too far away from home because yeah. I always make decisions based on my travel to Mexico because I go very often. Of course. So I'm like, yeah. So I'm like, no, it's too far away. Um, so anyway, at the end of this, the year, there was a competition that the CFDA, which is the Council of Fashion Designers of America, came up with Eileen Fisher to figure out a solution for all of the damage inventory that they were collecting through their take back program. Mm -hmm. um, so a teacher of mine, um, she came to me, she's like, Carmen, be on the look for this competition because I think it's going to be around your alley. Like, just start looking at who's Eileen Fisher. So I'm like, okay, fine. So I think that's how like I applied for that. And then I was one of the winners. So that's mm. how I, I went straight into Eileen Fisher because of these. But honestly, I had no idea who I wanted to work for. Yeah. And of course, I mean, as a recent lawyer, you probably don't have a lot of options, you know, like yeah. You, yeah. You, you don't get to say who you want to work for. Yeah. yeah I just yeah, yeah. happen to be very lucky um, to be part of this program, you know, so that's how yeah. I started. Amazing. Now, eight years have gone by. Um, yes. <laughs> tell us to everyone that's listening, what is your job at Eileen Fisher? How does it work? Mm -hmm. How is the whole, you know, setup of take back and recycling in a snapshot? Yeah. So I'll start with what's the take back program because that started way before me, right? Uh, so Eileen Fisher started a take back program in 2009, but it did not start it with, um, well, it started because Eileen Fisher, that foundation, wanted to start getting funds to put more into this organization so they can support more women's and children initi initiatives. Mm -hmm. So at that point, uh, they were like, well, why don't we start taking back the garments from our employees, right? Because we have a really nice clothing allowance. So everybody mm -hmm. has a lot of Eileen Fisher in their clothing, <laughs> uh, in their closet, sorry. So... They, they said, like, okay, we can take it back, clean it, and resell the good ones at our local Irvington uh, store, the, yeah. the lab store, right? So they did that, and they saw that our customers loved buying those secondhand garments. So in 2013, I mean, it went, like, through a lot of period of, like, yeah. you know, how can we do this? They opened it up to everybody, all of the customer base, you know? So that's when we did, like, well, we, I, I was not part of the company then. I came in in 2015. But the company did a huge campaign that it was called, We Want Our Clothes Back. Thank you very much. It was mm -hmm. one of the first ones, if not the first one programs who started doing that, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, I, I don't know when Patagonia started their take-back program, but they also started doing that. But so, yeah, since 2009, the program started. But the thing is that they only had solutions for the resellable garments, which are first quality, like new right mm -hmm. they they were accumulating for a couple years the damage inventory so they did not know what to do and that's when they brought three recently graduate students to figure out what to do with them mm -hmm. so basically my job is still the same it's just bigger responsibilities and bigger but mm -hmm. <laughs> right? which is good <laughs> and, yeah, which is good yes my job from the very beginning was like what do we do with these garments? It has to be beautiful, profitable, and it has to be, you know, streamlined. Mm -hmm. So we did, we, with the other two girls, which was Lucy Jones and uh, Tesla Dowd, um, they were, we were actually friends from Parsons. We were really close friends. And it was open to all the schools in the United States. Like, we just happened to win. And, of course, this went to Parsons' head. <laughs> they were like, yay, yeah. Parsons. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, in, during that year, it was very smart of the company to be like, okay, in order for you to figure something out, you first need to understand our business. Mm -hmm. So we spent four months just being like a fly in the wall for every single uh, company group, like, sorry, uh, team. So from finance, you know, like design, manufacturing, you name it. Mm -hmm. I mean, my first two weeks, I spent there rotating in all of the Alien Fisher stores, you know, sweeping, uh, cleaning and like That's talking so cool. to customers. Yeah. So really getting to understand the company and the business. Yeah. And then they were like, okay, now you're ready. Now go and do something, right? Mm -hmm. So we implemented a, a remanufacturing uh, business at scale, right? And that, that's how I started building my remanufacturing career. Mm -hmm. um, and we did like a remanufacturing collection at the end of this year. It was only going to be a year. Um, mm -hmm. But at, at the end of the year, Eileen was like, 
well, do you guys want to stay? And of course, I say, two of us say yes. And Lucy, my friend, just uh, left because she's more into the disabled uh, design community. Um, right. So she's doing amazing work there. So, yeah, I mean, again, now my job is still, I'm responsible for the damage inventory. So my job has, uh, you know, just really make all of the connections, implement the systems and streamline all of the solutions that we currently have. That is so cool. And yeah, and, and I, <laughs> that, that, um, the fact that you have to go through all of the departments uh, first is so smart because if you really want to drive change efficiently, you got to understand how everything works. Um, so that makes a, a lot of sense. Um, so now basically the remanufacturing, just to summarize and to make sure that, 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 that I got it, um, you take the items that are damaged that mm -hmm. otherwise would go to waste and mm -hmm. you basically create new garments out of it, um, or send it to, um, places where they can be used in another way. Is that correct? So remanufacturing is just one out of the four solutions that we currently have okay. right so remanufacturing itself is like you use the garments as fabric to make entirely new product you don't shred mm -hmm. them you don't nothing you know so just kind of like deconstruct the garment and make new product but we do it at scale right so mm -hmm. for example if we need if we make a new dress out of silk tops we deconstruct the silk tops right and we sew a new dress with mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. but we have four solutions right so we get around ninety thousand garments damaged garments per year right okay wow. on a yearly basis yes so overall the program gets uh around a quarter million garments per wow. year we get around twenty thousand garments a month we wow. buy them back from our customer. This is something that I forgot to mention. We buy them back by our customer and we give them a $5 coupon code for any garment. It does not matter if it's a brand new garment or it can be like a completely destroyed pair of pants. Mm -hmm. We buy them back, no questions asked. So what happens is that they come through our um, facility in Irvington, New York, where they we sort everything there. Everything yep. gets sorted by sellable and damaged. So sellable gets clean in, locally, right? And then those get put into a resale channels. We have a partner who does all of our e-commerce, which is Trove. Um, they do at EileenFisherRenew.com. The rest of the garments also get sold through uh, some of Eileen Fisher stores and our two Eileen Fisher Renew stores, one in Seattle and one here in New York. So that's uh, two thirds of the inventory gets to be sellable. Then a third is donate, is damage. So with that, the first thing that we do is we pull for mending, you know, or for refurbish, which refurbish is something that I'm kind of currently exploring the costing, mm -hmm. who is our partner and everything. And mostly it's just like extra treatment for cleaning. Um, but yeah, so everything gets pulled for cleaning, like, you know, extra treatment or refurbish or repair, right? So we can either resell them, right, back into our reset channels. Then the second part goes to our... Um, Fiber to fiber. Well, no, fiber to fiber is kind of like the last one. So first is for uh, repair or refurbish. Then it goes to a special collections, right? So special collections is remanufacturing is one of them. So within the special collections is like we do our waste no more program, which we create felted materials out of the garments. And then mm -hmm. we make accessories, home goods, and wall works from it. Then we do our mended collections, right? Which is like this visual mending. Then mm -hmm. we do our remanufacturing, which mm -hmm. um, the last remanufacturing that we did is like we deconstructed velvet garments and we make scrunchies and like uh, velvet pouches for Eileen Fisher, the main line. And mm -hmm. then the scrunchies, people love them. We almost sold out very quickly. That's cool. Um, and then the last one. So it's it's over dye. So we we work with a company in Seattle that is called um, Botanical Colors. And they over dye some of their slightly damaged garments, you know, into indigo or other colors. Um, so those are the special collections. So that's kind of like the second solution. The third solution is fiber to fiber recycling, which is 65% of our inventory, damaged inventory gets allocated to fiber recycling. So this is like 100% wool garments, 100% uh, cotton, cotton spandex, 100% linen mm -hmm. um, and silks. Again, these are garments that we cannot do what I have said previously, yes. right? You can repair them, you can do it because they're like highly damaged. And for that, it's like shredding and making new yarn with it, right? Um, and then the last one is downcycling, which is um, 
that's an open loop to other industries. So that gets turned into shoddy for the automobile and build industry for mm. insulation. Sorry, mm. that was a lot of information, but that's, no, it, I manage all of that. <laughs> <laughs> that's fascinating, Carmen, and so many layers to it that are so interesting. But also, when you look at it from up from you know from, from as an outsider, it it looks like a monster. You know, it looks it like is. a big, you know, enterprise like production. And I I can imagine pitching that to a fashion brand that has none of it. That must sound very scary, um, and and very expensive. Um, I imagine this came to be very in a in a very you know step by step way in at Eileen Fisher. I cannot imagine this all just popping up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. So. Mm, my question is, you know, how big of a challenge do you think it is to reproduce such a, such a, you know, a business at that scale in, in other fashion brands, now that you have seen it been built from the ground up almost, um, mm -hmm. I'm, do you think that's even, you know, feasible to translate into another fashion brand or is it something that Eileen Fisher has because of a special component of their brand of the company? I think it's the latter. So yeah. uh, first, I think at Eileen Fisher, we're able to do the majority of these in-house, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning in-house, we sort in-house. Um, we, we keep all of the operations in-house, but we do have partners for like, you know, fiber recycling, for cleaning, for stuff like that, for a re-commerce. But It works for us because we have one of the biggest take back programs, right? We buy back 20,000 garments of just Eileen Fisher by the month, right? Mm -hmm. We are the majority of our garments are already kind of like designed for circularity without really truly that intention. Mm -hmm. Eileen Fisher started 40 years ago, basically designing for circularity. You know, they're very simple garments, you know, high quality materials that last a long time there's not a lot of blends and there's a lot of natural fiber. So that in itself allows us to really reutilize the materials and give them, recapture the value, the lost mm -hmm. value, we want to say, of these mm -hmm. garments and give them a higher one. But I don't think this model is replicable in any other company. The reason why is because it requires a lot of resources, right? And the same way, and I keep saying this, the same way that you do not own your sewing factories, you should not own your post-consumer supply chains, basically, okay. right? Okay. That's why in the last couple of years, we have seen a boom of circular economy infrastructure business models that are supporting these operations, right? Mm -hmm. You see a lot more companies doing sortation, right? Like you have the brand, well, the brand has been doing it for like 15 years. They're like amazing. They do sortation for companies and they try to, again, uh, divert these garments to the highest quality, um, you know, recapture the highest quality of the garments that they can. But you have the sortation partners. Um, you know, you have now companies that they're really looking into, like, you know, they're refurbishing, they're repairing, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of these vendors claim that they can do remanufacturing. But if you want to call remanufacturing, just, you know, I mean, not at the level that we know how to remanufacture, yeah. <laughs> you know, everybody wants to do a tote with their T-shirts. And I'm like, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, it is manufacturing, <laughs> but not at a really nice level, right? right. Um, so there's a lot more people doing all of offering these services and, of course, offering the front end technology, which is mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest thing that we've seen in the um, past years, you know, like companies offering re-commerce, you know, um, right. and 3PL services for, um, yeah, for the circular economy. So I think the companies should be able to handle take back programs, but not on their houses by going to these service providers. Um, that's, I, I think that's how we're going to scale these. And I think that's how more companies are going to be able to do it. The only challenge that we're seeing right now is that all of these processes, basically is labor. Labor mm -hmm. in the United States is very, well, it's not expensive. It's just like fair, like people are paid yeah. fairly, right? Yeah. Um, so labor in the United States is quite expensive. So everything is labor. You're touching for sorting, you're touching for cleaning, you're touching for deconstructing, mending, overdime, remanufacturing, you name it. So not everybody can afford to do this. Yeah. And also not every brand has a quality in their garments to be able to do this, mm -hmm. right? 
So these are not the solutions for everybody. I think every single company has to really analyze their product Mm -hmm. and be like, okay, I want to be responsible for these garments. I want to start a take back program, but what would that look like if those garments come back to me? Right. Can I resell them? Are they high quality for me to resell them? Can I repair them? Can my customer afford the price of repair? If not, can they be recycled? Mm-hmm. Can they be recycled? Right. Yeah. So I think like a lot of these, it's very tricky, but like companies should not be doing it on their own. Yeah, that's so um, uh, on point. I mean, it, sometimes we, we like to um, be too simplistic about things in life and say, oh, remanufacturing sounds fantastic. Everyone should be doing remanufacturing. But the yeah, truth no. is, like you said, there are companies that just their products will not allow for that. So mm-hmm. they have to find a solution that fits them. So if I understand you correctly, you think that the way in which the industry should move um, it to achieve a more circular kind of like system is less about doing things in-house and more finding ways in which there is a real ecosystem of providers that take care of different pieces of the of the value chain, right? Exactly. And it's the same as the first, uh, first life um, supply chain, right? Well, there's there's companies that do like vertically integrated that they do everything, right? Yeah. But there's a, there's a lot of um, businesses that specialize in things, right? Like mm-hmm. you have the mills, you have the dye houses, you have mm-hmm. the farmers. I think until we really start being honest about our true, you know, niches, mm-hmm. you know, and only provide those things, then like people can start like, okay, then I'm, I can go there for sorting. And then the sortation facility can divert those to the people who know how to mend yeah. or like the people who know how to remanufacture or the fiber recyclers. Um, you know, in my in the initial idea, I was like, there should be a company who handles all of it. It can be possible, right? But I don't think everybody has the expertise to know what mm-hmm. to do with it. Mm-hmm. And the reason why at Lean Fisher we have all of those solutions is because there's no one solution that addresses the amount of inventory that comes back to you, right? right? You can resell all of them. You can just fiber recycle everything. You have to use a huge amount of solutions for you to be responsible for all of it. Yeah. I think the key word that you just said was, you know, honesty, being honest with yourself as a company of what can you do, what can you offer uh, in a way that actually creates an impact because you're being efficient, but also potentially as consumers, we also got to be honest and maybe more informed about what should we demand um, mm-hmm. from companies? Sometimes we are just, we demand something that is not possible and we, we discard or we expect, expect a change to come in very drastically um, mm-hmm. when the industry is moving, you know, and, and finding things out at, at, at a, at a pace. So um, that's a, that's an interesting um, kind of like way to look at it. Um, and now asking you, specifically about the remanufacturing process for the for the special lines if i'm not mistaken that's that's the name right mm-hmm. um how do you manage sorting and documenting mm-hmm. what you have so that you can decide what to do yeah so you're, you're getting into the juicy things uh <laughs> sortation is the most important step of the whole operation if you don't know what you have in house you can't propose solutions for it so we actually, so our sorting, how it happens is like it comes to garments from the store, sort of return, you know, comes through our main sorting team. You know, it's kind of like the first sortation. Then they pass where it's sellable and non-sellable. Then the non-sellable goes to the one person, which is Elizabeth Michaka. She's from Colombia. She's so talented. She's amazing. She can sort up to a thousand garments a day on her own. Wow. Um, so she, I worked very closely with her to really establish the sortation guidelines for each one of these solutions. Each sortation guideline is different for each solution, right? The fiber recycling will have different specs than what I'm looking for remanufacturing or over dye or things that we're going to be mending, Mm -hmm. right? So she has a cheat sheet that we have worked together on like, what are the things that I'm looking for each one of these categories? And then she goes and she sorts them into that. Yes. Just to put you an example, so for example, for fiber recycling, uh, for wool, and even like varies from fiber to fiber because each one of these fibers goes to different vendors in different yeah. parts of the world. So each vendor has its own specs. So for wool, 
it's fairly easy. It just has to be 100% wool. It doesn't matter the color. It doesn't matter if it's tops or bottom. They just want it all, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's easy, right? Mm -hmm. But for linen, because we don't have 100% a, a full partner for the whole linen category, we have to sort it by color right mm. so for example well color family group all of the blues and purples go together orange mm -hmm. and reds and pinks go together because linen we only fiber recycle when we make our own yarn with it so for example right now as we speak we're going to start pulling all of the blacks and the whites neutrals and grays from this inventory to send to spain to our partner halitex to make a new yarn so if i didn't have it sorted by that and then i have to resort everything so again everything is already sorted by spec according to our partners and for remanufacturing gets even more trickier because we're using the garments as fabric right mm -hmm. so the garments have to be first sorted by fiber so for example in this case for the scrunchies right that we did um velvet right then by color and then their tops or bottoms right mm -hmm. um back in the day we used to even sort it by sizing because wow. you know an extra large pant is not gonna give me the same fabric as a small yeah. pant so yeah. but now we kind of like got to a point where we don't need to store that nitty-gritty we're like very efficient and we can do it as we're you know pulling the garment so it's very different depending on the solution and then once you have all of this data then it goes into um excel sheet right <laughs> and 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 processing all of that so that you can come up with a design with that um is still like a, a mix between excel and and your head i would imagine and your brain um yeah. and do you see yeah how much of that takes out takes the efficiency away is that changing or can you give us a glimpse uh, of, of how it works yeah i mean again it's a year of experience at this point but we do have we started documenting everything you know like for example for for remanufacturing right like if we were to do the scrunchies right we will have like um a lot of documents you know we mm. will first have like a um, sortation uh ticket so we will give the ticket to our uh, elizabeth our sorter our senior sorter and be like this is exactly the garments that i need she will go she will pull them right but actually i'm gonna step back i'm gonna even go back further before I even start a collection, right, I start looking at the inventory. Okay. You know, back yeah. in the day when we did more remanufacturing, right now we're slowly picking up because Lisa and Eileen are very excited about it again. Um, Lisa is our new CEO. Um, but, well, what's I going to say? Sorry, I lost my train. But... No, it's that mm -hmm. you oh, yes, were looking yes. at the inventory. Yeah. So before starting a collection, I will ask the design team, can you share me the 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 line sheet for spring 19 let's just say right so i will look at what was there what were they're doing in house where the colors the fabric the materials so then that will inspire me to make something in relation to that collection right mm -hmm. at the end of the day eileen will approve it so i have to kind of like have to follow the guidelines of eileen fisher aesthetic yeah so then i will go that's the first step then i will go into my excel sheet i'm like okay this season they're using a lot of yellow linen you know or like whatever linen so i'm like okay how much of yellow linen or what what amount of linen do i have and what are those materials that are like you know categories of their tops bottoms and yeah. how many units so based on that then i'm like okay then i want to do a dress and for the dress i need probably i need a lot of like tops right what are the tops that i have you know and then i start designing that way the inventory informs what I'm designing into it, yeah. right? Yeah. So that's how that's how it works. But everything it, everything has um, kind of like a, the tech pack, the regular tech pack for design is very different from the tech pack of remanufacturing, because you have to put how many garments per how many garments per style. What are mm -hmm. those garments? What are the fibers? What are the sizes that you're using for each one of those patterns that you're going to be mm -hmm. dividing that dress into? So it's a very nitty gritty complicated yeah. tech pack but it's easy for <laughs> us you know like i work with challenges i can never do just like a simple tech pack that would be yeah <laughs> <laughs> of course and it sounds fun when you know but yeah. maybe you know it's uh, how often does it happen that you come up with a proposal and then because you have to work with inventory instead of starting with with design it gets shut down they say no this is not gonna fly with eileen fisher as a brand 
Oh, a lot of times happened <laughs> in the past, <laughs> yes. Uh, but like, no, we actually have a lot of freedom to do, you know, styles. But no, um, back in the day, we had more freedom, right? Okay. Now, it, it has to really truly align aesthetically with the main line because Eileen has worked really hard lately, like, you know, in the past couple of years to really bring back the company to what it was, design aesthetic, you know, very mm -hmm. simple, high quality materials, you know, like system dressing, you know, you can flawlessly dress with any styling, mm -hmm. I'm sure. So we have to follow those guidelines, right? So now we cannot just do like color blocking and all of these. So <laughs> it has to be very like, for example, the scrunchies, some, something so simple, right? Like you can't yeah. even tell, like it's made from velvet garments. Um, so, you know, we present to, you know, to mainline, but mostly the buying team is the one in the very beginning was kind of like hard to get them into like, no, wait, we're the ones telling you how many units and what are the colors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not you telling us why, because we, I can't control, you know, my inventory. So it, yeah. it was like, but now they're used to it. Now they're like, how many can we do and what are the colors? Mm -hmm. And then I That's tell them cool. and then they do the buy. Yeah. But you know, I mean, also the fact that it's the 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 brand, uh, it's it's going to its basics, which are in principle very sustainable. You know, very sustainable mm -hmm. principles of let's build garments that can be used for a long time, and that they provide you know a style that also is probably I don't know. You will tell me if I'm wrong. Relevant for longer than just for the season, um, if that's the case from a point of view. Uh, but that's it. Seems like. Um, that is one of the things that that we're also valuing more in 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 the sustainability world in fashion. Yeah, stepping that, away from seasonality. Exactly, and like you know, for Eileen, it was like the line was getting out of her hands in a sense that there was like a lot of aesthetic that she was not was not how she started the company. So right. because of that, also they reduced significantly the amount of materials that they're using. Mm -hmm. You know, the name, like the number of styles, you know, they used to produce a lot more style. There was a lot more waste. And now, mm -hmm. you know, they really like going back to their core. Also, like reduce the amount of resources that they normally use. Yeah, I can imagine, of course, mm -hmm. um, more or less on average, how many units, how many items do you get in, in, in one of the special lines collections of remanufacturing? Yeah, I mean, again, uh, for this crunchies, this past one, we only did like 250 per SKU, so meaning mm -hmm. per style, per color. Um, back in the day, we used to, I think the maximum was like 400 units per, I mean, again, it's not like big because, you know, we were starting, I guess mm -hmm. we continue to do it by now. We probably increased. But yeah, it was like 400 units of like a simple tank top that we did, you know, like across all sizes, extra small to extra large. So yeah, it really depends cool. on the style. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine but also i mean I, I imagine that um because of the fact that it's remanufacturing it has an added value to it so maybe the scarcity plays in your favor um yeah. if people are into it um yeah exactly <laughs> yeah so how do you see now after being eight years at it you know building this this whole system how do you see the whole circularity space um how far have we come as an industry i think we're moving we're moving along pretty <laughs> slowly <laughs> <laughs> i mean we've seen i've seen a huge change right when when i started working at eileen fisher we were one of the only few take back programs doing these now everybody's doing a take back program which is great now you can see you see like a lot more SaaS, uh, resell, sorry, RAS, resell as a service platforms. Mm -hmm. Like you see a lot of them, a lot of innovations happening. I see a lot more like innovation in fiber recycling, you know. Um, so I think we're moving there. I mm -hmm. think we're not moving fast enough because I truly think that companies are still not buying 100% into these. It's a lot mm -hmm. of like, it's, it requires a lot of resources, internal resources, human resources and capital resources to be able to handle all of these. So I think until we got like a streamlined post-consumer supply chain, you know, um, that is more affordable for everybody to use, then we can start like seeing mm -hmm. the faster, you know, mm -hmm. rate to, towards circularity. Mm -hmm. If you think, um, considering that it is an expensive um, endeavor for a company 
Um, what do you think can accelerate that process? Do you think it comes from the regulatory environment? Do you think it comes from the consumer um, or from some other place? I think it. I think it has to like you know le legislation has to play a huge role, and then you know Europe. I'm not. I'm not so much. No, I'm not very knowledgeable about what's happening in the legislation uh, forefront, but I do think it has to play a huge role in it, right? Mm -hmm. Europe is very ahead of the game. You know, the California is setting a new bill, you know, uh, for companies to be more responsible for their um, post-consumer goods. So I think that will help companies to really start thinking about like implementing strategies that address their post-consumer goods. Mm -hmm right mm -hmm. uh or pre-consumer goods you know things that they cannot move um yeah so i think that will help that will support a lot but i also think that um there needs to be more players in the post-consumer supply chain there needs to okay. be more uh um you know sortation facilities you know more companies that offer you know remanufacturing mending and mm -hmm. you know we need to crack on the pricing for all of these you know it's yeah. not it's not um affordable for every brand right yeah. and also i think we need to be very honest again that not every brand has to follow the same guidelines mm -hmm. right for a lean fishery works that we're doing everything that we do but for like a fast fashion company it's not it's like resale yeah. You yeah. know, some fast fashion companies are doing resale. And that's great. I do buy fast fashion resale secondhand because <laughs> I am again, you know, like all of those people saying, like, why are we reselling fast fashion? Uh, what's the alternative? It's better right. for us to keep using it. So I don't yeah. understand those conversations. It get, like, gets me <laughs> so pissed. Anyway, going yeah. back to these, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, like maybe resale, yes, but repairing, no. Can you do recycling? And what are the type of recyclers? Or maybe your main focus is to actually, instead of investing time, like money on the post, can you start investing money on new technologies on the first life? So actually those garments are already have a solution by the end of life. You know, yeah. like big fast fashion companies have the money to really make a huge change in this industry, but implementing in the supply chain, you know, fair wages, chemistry safety uh you, you name it all of yeah, that yeah, rather yeah. than really spending money on mending or repairing their collections after you know so yeah absolutely yeah it's, i it's, lost it, track of the question it, but <laughs> this is i think this was pretty on point because you know there are many many ways in which they can efficiently make a big impact um it, with what they have already some of those fast fashion companies um but again, it brings back that thought of we as consumers being more informed about what can we demand and, you know, also taking in improvements in something that we will probably don't see. Like, for example, the actual, I don't know, labor conditions on the supply chain. We don't see that necessarily, uh, but that's a big step and something that will impact lives of, of millions and, and, and it's something that can be done, be done now, potentially. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's a great point. Um, um, now, what I want to ask you now, in looking at the broader um, space and what you're doing, you have another venture and uh, mm -hmm. you have your own company, yes. uh, Make a New. Um, tell us a little bit more about that um, and what do you do there? Yeah, I mean, it, it Make a New kind of like started because, you know, we talked about it, right? Like, I don't think companies should be doing this in their backyard. It does not make sense. It's not scalable for the whole industry. So, you know, a couple of years back, uh, me and my co-founder, Carolina, who was the recycling manager at Eileen Fisher at the time, she, we work a lot on like creating these systems of remanufacturing, you know, we were like, oh my God, you know, we should start doing, we should start offering these to companies because mm -hmm. we had, we, as you came to our facility, we had so many tours and a lot of brands were like, oh my God, this is amazing. We want to do it, but like, we don't have the money. We don't know how to do it. And in my head is like, you know, you should not do this on your own. <laughs> so then we were like fantasizing, oh my God, one day we should have a recycling center where we offer all of these because we know how to do it. Yeah. Well, the pandemic came and because the two of us are not people who can sit around doing nothing, <laughs> <laughs> we, um, we started like um, 
we started talking with people, you know, just to find out like how if we wanted to do these. But like a customer came without us reaching out, basically basically saying, um, hey, I have a lot of garments that I want to repair because I'm one of the top 10 resellers at Poshmark. So I go through a lot of inventory. I want to repair them. Do you know anyone? And we're like, oh, my God, we can do it. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we started a company with a customer, not Amazing. having a company. Yes. So we started repairing a bunch of garments for her during the pandemic in uh, Carolina's basement, which still our main uh, space, <laughs> right? Yeah. We took over her whole uh, basement, which is really cool, actually. Um, so, yeah, we started with clients. And since then, you know, we've been slowly growing with clients. You know, it's mm -hmm. mostly worth of mouth. We have never had to reach out to anyone, but, <clears throat> you know, to work with us. But basically what we do is um, we work with any size company or designer. You don't need to really know about design to work with us. But basically, you know, you have inventory that you know don't know what to do with it. You bring it to us. We can sort it for you and we can work with ideas. You know, we can tell you, hey, these can be repair, remanufacture, you know, or these can be recycled. And we have a lot of partners that, you know, we will connect you for that. Yeah. Right. But like the majority of the customers that come to us, they're mostly for remanufacturing because mm -hmm. that's what we are known for in the industry. Um, so sometimes we have like designers that know exactly what they want. You know, they will give us like, this is what I want. This is already mm -hmm. the pattern. This is the inventory. <laughs> just, just produce it for us. And sometimes like these, the person who was our first customer, she was like, I don't know how to design, but I want to make this dress that's like yeah. a tear sheet and like, I don't know what to do with it. So we work with them as a product development uh, process right. where we make that. So the thing is that we make something from the garments that you give us and give it back to you. We're not going to sell it for you. We're not going to nothing. At this point, that's what we do. So you give us something, we give you something back. So that's what we do for Make A New. Amazing. And again, yeah. So it's been exciting. <laughs> yeah. That's I mean that what a better way to start a company than with customers. Yes. Um, uh -huh. So that that's fantastic, and and it is what you are an expert in. So it makes uh, absolute sense. How do you, mm -hmm. how do you, you know, have these two jobs? Because having a company, <laughs> it's a yeah. it's a whole thing. Yeah, people love asking me that. It's like, how do you do it? And <laughs> I'm like, I don't know how do I do it, but I do it and I run every day and I go dancing and I have fun and I travel. I so maybe it's because I don't have kids. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> That's the secret. <laughs> but no, how do I do it? I mean, I have a very demanding full time job, but I live for sure. And honestly, yeah. 90% of my day or my time or my headspace goes to Eileen Fisher, right? Because I'm extremely passionate about the work that I do there. And I think I help the company a lot more towards circularity. Um, but at the same time, I had always had very supportive leaders internally. So I'd mm -hmm. be very transparent with what I do there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I use a lot of my free time to work with for Make A New. The yeah. thing is that I have Carolina, my co-founder. She basically managed all of the operations and like the productions and all of that. So it's not mm -hmm. so much that I'm like very hands-on. Mm -hmm. I do come hands-on when she needs me. Like, so it's mostly like in the evenings or the weekends, mm -hmm. uh, right? That I support that. But like, for example, for like smaller productions, we manage that in-house. Bigger productions, we have facilities in um, Brooklyn and Queens that can support that operation in case there's like larger volumes. But like... Mm -hmm. And again, you know, it's like this Saturday I'm going with her. We're going to start working on a new project. And like, you know, because also <laughs> she's my best friend. So we have yeah. such a good time doing it. So it doesn't <laughs> feel like work, you know. So that's, that's the true. part. It does not feel like work. So I think that's probably the secret, right? Um, and like you said, you can... That was amazing. You said, I, I can do many things. You know, you have a balance. You have a life. Sometimes we just, you know, think the only way to do it is by you know, not having a life. Um, no, I think, I think that I would not be able to do it. I would have right. like quit already, you know, like, I mean, quit my make a new uh, <laughs> company yeah. because yeah. like, if I don't enjoy life, life is not just about work, you yeah. know? So you just have to be very passionate about what you do. And then um, you have to enjoy life because yeah. you only live once. So. Absolutely. I agree. Um, Carmen, to wrap it up, um there must be so many people that want to 
join the industry, that want to have a job similar to yours. Um, and, and I hear a lot, I want to work in fashion sustainability. How can I do it? What is your recommendation? Where do you think the areas for opportunity, maybe um, areas where you know there is a, an interest from employers? What do you recommend to those early professionals or people switching careers as well? Yeah, you know, well, I'm actually, well, first, the platform that has, like, what's the best fashion, uh, jobs in fashion right now is the Sustainable Fashion Forum. Mm -hmm. That's a really great platform for people to go and see what are the uh, needs right now currently in the businesses. And honestly, what I'm seeing in, from there is that it's mostly about, like, compliance mm -hmm. and, like, you know, traceability mostly about kind of like sustainability as a holistic, you know, realm, mm -hmm. um, you know, from the supply chain, post-consumer supply chain. So it's like very holistic what they're looking. I don't think everybody's like a lean fisher, like really investing like a circular director, you know, like, mm. a, you know, um, we have so many like great uh, positions internally that um, support the whole operation. So I think if anything, if you're like trying to switch career, really start focusing a lot on the first life of the garments, mm -hmm. you know, chemistry, materials, uh, you know, regulation, uh, traceability, um, compliance, all of it. Right. And then the latter will come, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because, again, what I know. Like how many directors of circular design are there in the world? They're basically yeah. like none, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's mostly like sustainability director, and that really encases everything, mm -hmm, right? So mm -hmm. I think that's where the industry wants to uh, make their bets on people. Right. And what about for young emerging designers um, that want to start a, a line, a collection? Yes, I mean... That can be very overwhelming, right? Because unfortunately, a lot of the resources for people to make sustainable collections are not available for like smaller designers, which is so sad, honestly. It's like the minimums, you know, are so big. So I think, you know, for younger designers, really like map out what sustainability means for you, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and, and try to start with one thing. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you want to start focusing with materials, right? Or maybe you want to start focusing with garments that they're durable, right? Regardless of the material, right? Like that they're durable, that you want that garment to be like amazing design, that have like emotional durability, that, that when that person doesn't want to wear it anymore, she's going like, to pass it to someone or resell it. And, you know, like, so what are the key attributes that you have to do for that? Or maybe you want to start a line that you want those garments to come back to you because you want to make new garments from it. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's 100% cotton, right? Because when those garments have no life, they can come back to you. You can work with a fiber recycler, shred them and make, I mean, I'm making it sound so easy. <laughs> it is not that easy. <laughs> uh, but, you know, again, focus on one key thing, have a win, and then move into the next one. And that is not just my recommendation. Eileen loves saying this. And I, I, I'm a true believer of that. Baby steps. For That's smaller designers. For smaller designers. Big brands, no baby steps. Big steps. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I love that. Baby steps and big bets, uh, depending on who you are. Exactly. That's a, great way, that's a great way to wrap it up, Carmen. It was a pleasure chatting with you. Such an inspiration, um, I, not only for me, but I'm sure for, for a lot of people. Um, and yeah, keep up the good work. Um, I hope I can visit again. And um, yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you for, for the time. No, oh, thank you, Jaime. It was really nice talking to you. And I hope uh, your listeners will enjoy this conversation. I'm sure they will. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you.